Hey class, um, today we are going to be covering the Cold War, particularly the Red Scare. So first, uh, the quality of this video is probably not going to be the highest quality video you've seen. It might look like it was filmed with a potato, but it is what it is. Uh, I'm working with what I've got. Uh, there might be some lag time on the lips, um, so my computer is lagging a little bit as I film this, but we're just going to roll with it and we're going to adapt and overcome. So we're in chapter 22, we're on lesson 3, um, and we're going to be talking about the Red Scare today. So the first thing that we should know when we're talking about the Red Scare is that there are two Red Scares in American history. So there is the Red Scare of the late 19 teens and into the 1920s, and this is a post-World War I Red Scare. And then there's the Red Scare that we're talking about, which is the Cold War era Red Scare, which is in the late 40s and beyond. So the first Red Scare was uh, fear of communist forces infiltrating America and trying to set up a regime that would topple the American government through subversion, right? Uh, this Red Scare is actually pretty similar. It's just a matter of timing. And it's also a matter of the nuclear bomb being in play at this time. All right, so that helps people, it escalates people's fears um, and makes this Red Scare a much bigger deal than the Red Scare of the late teens into the 20s. So first thing about this Red Scare, um, so this would be the Red Scare during the Cold War, would be that People are very afraid of the spread of communism, and they see the threat of communism as a real thing that could actually topple our government. So the idea is that the communist forces that are, that are at work, these secret spy networks that are at work in America, and there were, by the way, secret spy networks in America that were at work, with the intent of toppling our government and replacing our government with a communist regime. So it's not like people had fears about things that didn't exist. These things did exist. It was just that the extent to which they existed and the extent of our response was a bit overblown. All right. So people were afraid of secret forces, communist forces with ties to Moscow, trying to topple our governmental system. So in order to, to combat these fears and to combat the spread of communism, um, President Truman in 1947 takes the first major step, and that is the loyalty review program. So Truman wanted to ensure that all government workers were loyal American citizens. Now, loyalty wasn't strictly defined. So what loyalty was, was what the government decided loyalty was. And there were screenings that were done to make sure that you, if you chose to be a government employee, didn't have any ties to communism. Right? So you basically had to prove that you were a loyal American who believed firmly in our Republican system of government, that we're a republic, a representative republic, and that we don't want a communist regime in place. Um, and you had to prove that and prove that you had no ties to communism at any point in your life. Um, and even things like what you watched as far as movies, books that you read, all that came into play. Uh, so if you happen to read the Communist Manifesto just for an educational venture, well, that's not going to look so good as you're going under your loyalty review. Also, uh, another thing that happened around this time um, in 1938, there was something established called the House Un-American Unacti uh, Activities Committee, and it's called HUAC. We'll just call it HUAC from now on, House Un-American Activities Committee. Um, and this committee would review un-American activities, whatever that meant, right? And in 1947, Hoover, not Herbert Hoover, but J. Edgar Hoover, um, who was in charge of the FBI at this time, decided to take this to Congress and say, we need to have public hearings. HUAC needs to have public hearings where un-American activities are put on trial. So if you are accused of un-American activities, you go before this committee and you have a public hearing. And again, things like movies that you watched 
or books that you read or associations that you had, places that you traveled. So if you might have traveled to Russia, you have family in Russia, well, it's not going to look so good when you go before HUAC. Um, and there were actually people that were what was called blacklisted at this time, where if someone thought that you were communistic, you might not be employed, you might lose your job, people might not have social dealings with you. Um, it's almost like the idea of being shunned. So a great example of this would be the Hollywood Ten. So there was a group of 10 actors and actresses who were suspected of having communistic leanings at this time. And they were essentially blacklisted in Hollywood. And it took a long time for people to start seeking out these actors and actresses again for parts um, it, until suspicion fell off of them. So suspicion was on them and people were distancing themselves from these actors and actresses. And then as time went on, um, they eventually were unblacklisted, some of them. Uh, okay, let's move on to some things that led credence to the anti-communist hysteria that was occurring in America. One thing was Alger Hiss. So Alger Hiss was accused in 1948 of being a spy for the Soviets. So Alger Hiss ends up Suing his accuser, he accuses the guy that accused him, so like a reverse accusation, of libel and sues him for this. But if you know the rules of slander and libel, truth is a defense. So you can say whatever you want to say about someone in print or in speech, not that you should, but you can, if you can substantiate it. And so Alger Hiss's accuser actually has proof that Alger Hiss was a spy for the Soviets. And this comes out in the libel trial. The problem is that there's something in America called the Statute of Limitations. And the Statute of Limitations had run out on the espionage that Alger Hiss had committed. So he was eventually found guilty of perjury or was shown to have perjured himself in this trial, but this trial was huge because it showed we actually did have people who were spying for the Soviets in America. And this caused greater anti-communist hysteria in America. Also, another trial that happened that caused more hysteria was the trial of the Rosenbergs. So, a husband and wife were accused of and were actually convicted of selling secrets to the Soviets from our nuclear program. Because the big question was, how did the Soviets get a nuclear bomb so soon after we got ours? There was a lot of research that went into making our bomb, and they didn't quite have the scientists that we had or the budget that we had to invest into developing the bomb. So we suspected, the American government suspected, that there were spies who had actually been filtering information to the Soviets. So the Rosenberg trial showed that we did indeed have spies in America that were filtering these secrets to the Soviets and that the Soviets were able to get the bomb so soon after we got our bomb because of communist spies in America. Uh, by the way, the Rosenbergs were sentenced to death um, and were executed. Another thing that really kicked off a, a stream of anti-communist hysteria in America was something called Project Verona, and it was an attempt to crack the Soviet code, and when the code was cracked, their communications code, it did show that there was extensive spying being done in America. There were thousands of messages that were going back and forth between the United States and Moscow and it showed that there were these rings of communist spies in America that were working to subvert our government and were also working to extract sensitive information from our government and feed it back to the communists. So all these things are working in concert to kick off a next level stage of anti-communist hysteria in America. Um, so Anytime there's a crisis, people look for leadership. They look for leaders who will address the crisis. 
Um, kind of like, I mean, just speaking of the elephant in the room right now, um, people are wanting leadership in this time of uncertainty. And President Trump is providing leadership. He's having daily uh, updates. He's also <clears throat> provided payments for Americans who aren't able to work um, and provided hundreds of billions of dollars of stimulus, uh, put travel bans on and given recommendations for ways in which we can stop the spread of the virus. Also on the state level, Governor Wolf is addressing this uh, current crisis as well. I mean, current issue, I don't want to call it a crisis, but current issue as well. So people look toward leadership. Well, if there's a leadership vacuum, somebody's going to fill it. So this is what happens during the Red Scare. Um, Joseph McCarthy, who was a senator, he fills this void in the leadership against communism in America. So he was not a very prominent person politically. As a politician, he was just kind of a, a somebody, but not a somebody, like not a big name. Like today, a big name would be like Nancy Pelosi, for example, or Mitch McConnell in politics. Those would be big names in politics as far as um, our legislature is concerned, right? Uh, McCarthy was not a very well-known name, but he becomes a household name by saying to the press that he had a list in his hand. He's holding these papers here. And I have a list in my hand of 250 five communist sympathizers within the American government, right? So as soon as he makes this claim, and by the way, he never had any proof of any of this, he never really found any communist spies working within the American government, right, or substantiated his claims, but as soon as he makes this claim, people just shh, stick to him, and they're like, oh, this is the guy that has the info that we need to save America. Um, so McCarthy gained a lot of control in the legislature and starts holding hearings, public hearings, to investigate people accused of communism. Now, he's eventually going to be his own undoing because McCarthy wasn't a very nice man, right? He wasn't someone that dealt with grace or mercy with those who were accused. He grandstanded a lot and he was trying to advance his own agenda. And the undoing of McCarthy was actually television. So the first televised hearings that McCarthy held to investigate someone accused of communism actually ended up with McCarthy being shamed on TV, and it led to the legislature censuring him. Um, so that's a bad thing where they take punitive measures against the politician. So McCarthy loses a ton of popularity because of the censure, but the censure occurred because of the way in which he dealt with those accused of being communists. So for a few years, he had great sway and great power in politics, but the way in which he dealt with people actually led to his downfall. Okay, a couple more things to talk about. Just switch my notes here. Um, one would be the McCarran Act. All right, so this goes to show that people are willing to trade freedom for the idea of safety, right? So Benjamin Franklin, paraphrased version, says never trade essential liberty for the perception of safety. So the idea is if you give up, and he, he says if you do that, you end up getting neither, right? So this act is proposed as an idea to thwart communism, and it, it provided limited rights for known communists. So people who were known communists, uh, for example, weren't allowed to have passports because passports allow you to travel. Um, and there were other ways in which this limited rights for communists, um, but it singled out communists in America and put extra restrictions on them. Now, if you look back to World War II, we have a similar precedent for this uh, with the Japanese Americans in America being interned, right? Internment camps were established, and in Korematsu versus the United States, and in subsequent Supreme Court cases, the Supreme Court upheld the idea that loyal Americans um, couldn't be in, put in internment camps, but they didn't really define what loyal was. and 
they in, inferred that Japanese Americans could not be expected to be loyal citizens. Therefore, internment was constitutional. So it allowed for unequal enforcement against American citizens. However, the Supreme Court steps up against the McCarran Act and limits it uh, pretty significantly and sets the precedent that you can't have unequal enforcement against different sets of Americans, that there are constitutional protections against that, uh, one of which is the 14th Amendment, right, uh, which provides for equal protection under the law and for due process under the law. All right. A um, couple things. One is, as goes society, so goes entertainment. And during the Red Scare, entertainment shifted and was focusing more on communistic-based themes, right? Um, shows or movies about spying or about people who were spies um, or about spying existing in America or communist plots in America. And another thing that you see and you watched yesterday was the duck and cover video. Um, the reason I had you watch that is this is part of the Red Scare because as the nuclear bomb comes onto the scene and everybody has the nuclear bomb, uh, by everybody I mean the two major world powers that matter at this point in time, the Soviets and the United States. And since we both have the bomb, there's the big threat of nuclear warfare. And so duck and cover is produced to help calm people's fears of the bomb being dropped. Uh, I think it has quite the opposite effect, um, and it makes people more fearful of nuclear war. But what I want you to see today is that people are fearful of communism, and that as the Red Scare kicks off, there is a real threat. There are communists who want to overthrow America. There just aren't very many of them, and the amount of influence they have is very limited. It's mostly just getting sensitive intel out of our country to the Soviets. It's not really going to cause a massive shift in our governmental system at that time. But that's what people are afraid of, a massive shift of our governmental system through subversion. And it affects our entertainment. It affects government films like Duck and Cover, where in schools children are taught how to protect themselves from nuclear war. And it leads to people being blacklisted and for limited rights of people who are communists or who are accused of being communists. All right, so that's the Red Scare right now in a nutshell. We'll touch on this in more detail in the coming days. But this sets the stage for the rest of the Cold War. All right, thanks for watching, guys.